This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description, and you also get access to my streaming video service, Nebula. From their punk-filled debut, Said there ain't no rest for the wicked, money don't grow on trees, to the fine pop melodies of Melophobia, and the sulkier songs of social cues. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready to let go. Cage the Elephant are one of the most consistently entertaining bands of this generation. Their five records have covered a ton of sonic ground, making it difficult to corner them into just one subgenre of rock. They arrived at precisely the time when post-punk revival began seeing a bit of a suppression, and it's clear the group saw this coming, as they transitioned towards a more pop-centric sound as time went on. Looking a little closer at the group's songwriting reveals frequent reflections on their thoughts and feelings on making music, their attempts at maintaining creative freedoms, and realizing an overall musical identity. Let's uncage the elephant and take a look at what the former punk band had to become in order to stay relevant. In 2006, Matt Schultz and his bandmates were known as Perfect Confusion and had just released their self-titled LP. You better learn to love somebody or make peace and be free. One night after a performance in Knoxville, Tennessee, a mentally disturbed man came charging at Schultz. Fearing for his life, he was surprised when the man with a shaved head and goatee hugged him instead, repeatedly shouting, you have to cage the elephant, you have to cage the elephant. It was at that moment, Schultz decided to rename his band Cage the Elephant. After performing at South by Southwest in 2007, the band was signed to Relentless Records and would go on to support Queens of the Stone Age on a tour throughout Canada. Shortly after, Cage would move from their home in Kentucky to East London, looking to build a solid European fan base before trying to make it in America. And it worked. They performed on British Late Night before releasing their self titled debut. We ain't got the tune, just gonna put us on the map, and I'm a phony in disguise trying to make the radio. With childlike wonder and eyes fixed on radio play, the group brought a cohesive garage punk sound and a strong vision for their future. From their very first single, it was apparent the band wanted to recapture the bite of punk that flourished at the turn of the millennium. But they were also pretty self-aware, knowing that their sound was potentially outdated. So they say I'm just a stupid kid, another crazy radical, rock and roll is dead, I probably should have stayed at school. And their biggest hit, Ain't No Rest for the Wicked, proclaimed their understanding of what people had to do for money to simply survive. It's the track that put Cage the Elephant on the map. Appearing in the opening sequence of the RPG shooter Borderlands, it would go on to reach number 32 on the UK singles chart, number 3 on the alternative songs chart, and just sliding into Billboard's Hot 100. The album garnered them plenty of attention. But some listeners found their inspirations too generic or obvious and felt like their sound wasn't anything brand new, especially coming out in 2008. Their niche of punk funk was filled and didn't really have much more room for newcomers. Tracks like Judas refer to the greed of the powers that be, possibly government or music labels. It could hint at their view of the music industry, believing they'd eventually have to change their sound or give up some of their heart in order to make ends meet. It's a worry that seemed to be apparent when crafting their follow-up, Thank You Happy Birthday. The band began backpedaling. They had recorded more than 80 tracks but weren't very excited by any of those ideas. So they scrapped them all and what we ended up getting were taken from ideas they had saved for other projects. Shake Me Down planted a seed of where their sound would begin heading. With an upbeat rhythm section and Schultz's vocal delivery, it carried some great dynamic variants while also pointing towards the group's feelings on following the path they had chosen, to pursue music even if the band lost its fame and fortune. In his life, Schultz had seen people chasing the past, walking into the sea, only to be met with memories. This leads to a feeling of despair and inadequacy to live up to the expectations of your past self. The past had nothing more to offer Schultz, so he needed to keep moving forward in order to grow both as a musician and as an individual. But Schultz was having difficulties in finding inspiration for songwriting. It's a dilemma that's furthered in Sell Yourself, 
a critique on modern record companies only caring about making money and taking creative control of artists in order to produce what the label wants. Well, I tried to paint my mind, but now I'm stuck here in the middle. Got this scalpel in my hand, I'm operating on this riddle. Got my tongue on the band tried to paint their mind and express their creative vision in the way they wanted to, but it didn't work out that way. With this second record, they were stuck in the middle. They could try and paint their mind again and perhaps risk something, or they could create a poppier, more approachable sound. And because of that, Schultz seemed tongue-tied. He wanted to say something, but couldn't say it outright for whatever reason. Some of their inspiration may have been taken away now that business and money were more involved in their work, rather than just pure musical expression. Schultz and the band were trying to move forward, but felt as though they were leaving something behind. After releasing their debut and experiencing a great deal of success, the band had grown and their perspective on things changed. They were stuck in the now as time went on and on and couldn't let go of their past expectations they had set for their future selves, not being able to see past their own eyes. As a result, there is an uneven flow across Birthday's track list, plenty of highs but also lows. The inner angst was evident as Cage's career approached a sort of adolescence. Their earlier vision and direction in sound wasn't nearly as explicit. So, Cage the Elephant would put forth a concerted effort to find their own distinct musical identity with Melophobia. Five years removed from their debut, and their punk sound was pretty much gone, replaced by a sleek, shimmery indie pop rock sound. Melophobia means the fear of music, but this album wasn't so much about the fear of music as it was about the fear of making music. Schultz had had revelations about songwriting. He felt like the more he tried to cater to the cool or artistic, the further he'd get from those honest moments of inspiration. And so, Melophobia saw Cage the Elephant begin just trusting what came first. This was the group's young adulthood era, where they're just getting the hang of things, but also still taking risks. Their old sound had nothing left to say and with nowhere left to turn, they had to change. Despite the industry encouraging artists to continue creating what sells, Cage wanted to keep growing. The band wanted to make the music that they wanted, and hopefully their fans would enjoy it too. What would become one of their most popular tracks, Cigarette Daydreams, offers a softer sound than most of their previous work. It's the band doing something unexpected and genuine to them. We can find a reason, a reason to change. The track presents the pain of one's search for identity, something the band were in the midst of. It helped the group take a whole new approach to songwriting, open themselves up to a new sound, and simply be honest with who they were. Melophobia, in my opinion, is the band reaching their peak. Toning down their punk style in favor of a lighter indie rock sound proved to be exactly what the band needed to finally cement their place in the indie rock landscape. The charisma they exuded, the fun retro sounds they delivered, and the undeniably catchy hooks made the entire record a must listen. After joining the Black Keys on a number of tours, Keys member Dan Auerbach would go on to help produce Cage the Elephant's fourth record, Tell Me I'm Pretty. Living up to Melophobia would not be an easy task. The band had had troubles with rediscovering their direction thus far, and with Tell Me I'm Pretty, it would have them struggling between making the music they wanted versus the music they felt they had to in order to satisfy their previous vision, new fans, and of course, label execs. Schultz hadn't completely given up, but his interest in making music seemed to shift. It's possible their passion had fallen by the wayside despite not necessarily wanting it to, but it sounded like music wasn't their love anymore, but rather a way to put food on the table, giving up some of their heart in order to make ends meet. Tell Me I'm Pretty was a rather safe and redundant entry into their discography. The band claimed to have wanted to experiment with sound on the record, and while it's still a consistent effort like Melophobia was, it certainly wasn't much of a significant evolution. And having Auerbach in the production chair left them sounding a bit like their indie rock contemporaries. This was the adulthood stage of their careers, 
where the band was doing what they had to in order to maintain and solidify everything they'd already accomplished. It's them acknowledging that they had made it, and now needed to make the best of it. And in usual fashion, the Grammys awarded Cage's safest record with Best Rock Album of the Year. Why would the band stray away from this winning formula, considering their pop adjustment was clearly working? It's a problem that became a running motif through much of their next record, Social Cues. Cage the Elephant as the band originally envisioned themselves were dead. By their fifth studio record, they had reached full maturity, delivering a darker and more melodramatic tone with their music. Much of the record speaks to the theme of hollow fame and success. Think it's strange when people say the next big thing will never fade. The title track reflects on the band's anxieties that came with being a successful rock group. Upon their debut and later with Melophobia, they were most likely looked at as the next big rock band, something that only adds more pressure to the creative process. Even continually reminding himself of their success, Schultz is left unfulfilled and questioning if he wants to continue on with being a frontman. But at least this phony in disguise made the radio. At least you're on the radio. Being on the run, touring, and living the star-studded life for so long has left Cage somewhat destroyed. I've been running for so long. All that's left is skin and bone. If they were to give up this fight, if they were to stumble or fall, would they be forgotten and lose all that they've built? Well, Schultz feels like he'd just tuck and roll and hope for the best. But he'd rather not find out. At this moment, all the band can do is hope they end up in the right place. Somewhere, or some sound they can call home. Close my eyes and let the love light get me home. Let the love light get me home. On Goodbye, the band have made peace with having to abandon their original vision. They are now Cage the Elephant as the world knows them, and they've drifted too far from their punk origins to ever really return to them. It's something they have mixed feelings over even now. Stop wasting time trying to shape your life. It's alright, goodbye. They're angry, happy, and afraid all at once. They had initial ideas of how they would shape their career, but it didn't go according to plan. In fact, it worked out better than they had even anticipated. So they advise anyone against trying to plot out their path, calling it a waste of time. They had already experienced so much unintended change from their original vision that by now, it didn't really matter. They're the only version of Cage the Elephant that ended up existing. While not particularly adventurous, Social Cues finally saw Cage the Elephant carve out their own niche in contemporary alternative rock, delivering yet another album the Grammy saw fit to label best rock album. But at what cost? And where does the group go next? Cage the Elephant are a band that have helped define the alternative rock genre over the last decade. Across their five releases, they've retained a sense of creative freedom and an ever-changing sonic identity, while maintaining a strong general appeal. They're in that semi-rare category of bands who've been able to do that. From their childlike punk beginnings, to the sonic rediscovery when crafting Melophobia, to the maturity of social cues, Cage the Elephant have managed to transition their sound in order to stay relevant in today's musical landscape while staying true to themselves. They avoided catering to what others wanted from them and continuously learned to trust their own musical instincts. Makes you wonder what Cage the Elephant were ever so afraid of. Cage the Elephant couldn't predict their future, but someone who did a fantastic job of foretelling what the world would become was science fiction author Philip K. Dick. His work has been adapted into some of my favorite films of all time, from Blade Runner to Minority Report and Total Recall. And if you've ever read one of his books, you'll quickly find yourself wanting to read all of his books. He constantly blurred the line between reality and imagination. But his stories were always about us, our present and our future. The Worlds of Philip K. Dick is a documentary that dives into the author's work and his various film adaptations, exploring the extent to which his stories reflect the nature of our current reality. This has been my absolute favorite find on Curiosity Stream so far, so I definitely recommend checking it out using the first link below. Throughout their career, Cage the Elephant aimed to maintain their creative freedoms. My creative friends and I have teamed up to do the same. We've built our own streaming platform, and it's called Nebula. 
It features a ton of exclusive content and originals from some of your favorite creators, like Adam Neely, Lessons from the Screenplay, Tom Scott, and a bunch of others. On Nebula, our content is ad-free and is a bit more inventive since we don't have to worry about some of YouTube's restrictions or its algorithm. And our partnership with CuriosityStream allows us to keep making it happen. From the founder of the Discovery Channel, CuriosityStream is home to some of the best documentaries on the internet. It's a pairing that just made sense. Educational content and educational creators. So here's the deal. When you sign up for CuriosityStream, you'll also get Nebula for free. You get CuriosityStream, you also get Nebula. There's a link in the box below for you to get started. And right now, you can get an annual CuriosityStream plan at 26% off. That's a pair of new streaming platforms at $14.79 for the full year. So head to the link in the description to get both CuriosityStream and Nebula for 26% off. It really helps support this channel and helps me deliver more videos to you on a regular basis. But tell me, what's your favorite Cage the Elephant record? Let me know in the comments below. Follow us at More Middle Eight on Twitter and Instagram. And that's it for me. Again, thanks for watching. Keep listening.